Um, we've had a very good conversation so far. Um, in uh, 45 minutes' time or an hour, we'll, we'll move into what you want from a Brexit exchange. Um, so that will be a chance to voice kind of general concerns and procedural hopes about what a good conversation consists of. Uh, someone's already explained to me that you need the civil servants here. We need that beekeeper. The, the beekeeper has to be in the room. Um, so that, that, that is a, a, an important perspective. But before we get to that, uh, we've got a panel up here to talk about opportunities and risks in managing the UK's departure uh, from the EU. Uh, I'll just introduce those. You've met Stefan already from the uh, German BDA, Employers Association. Next to me is Paul Drexler, the president of the CBI. So Paul um, can speak for employers generically here. Um, next to Paul, Catherine McGuinness is the policy chairperson, chairman, your policy chairman, aren't you, actually, of the uh, City of London Corporation. So obviously, primarily concerned with the service hub, the financial services uh, arrangements uh, that will be prevailing afterwards. And uh, next to me on the right is Christoph Bondi. Now, Christoph uh, from Volterra Fieta is a former senior counsel for the government of Canada. Why do we want the government of Canada in the room? Well, because they have lots of experience uh, of negotiating trade arrangements uh, with the EU. And um, Christoph... Uh, was senior counsel during the negotiations of the uh, Canadian European Union, Com European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, which we'll call CETA. Um, and Christoph, I thought we might just start with you. Sure. Just sort of outlining what a trade agreement consists of, and if you like, sort of what what your tips and your your battle scarred from that process, what your sort of advice about how to go about this would be. And we know that many people think it will be very different this time because we're starting from a very different place of mm -hmm. Canada and the EU. But we've also heard quite possibly the, you know, the Europeans will be treating it like the Canadian, you know, pretty well from scratch. So what, what, how, how did it go? Well, I, I don't want to um, uh, go through a, a sort of battle description of negotiations on the CETA, but I did want to address three things. Uh, one was what uh, business can be doing right now to prepare. Another uh, is a few comments on the complications of negotiating with the European Union. And then the third is just a bit of a comment on how the uh, a negotiation proceeds and some of the complications and why it takes a long time. Um, on the first point, I, can, I just wanted to echo really the comments that were made this morning about really the importance of, of business engaging and really thinking for themselves the, 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 about this, uh, uh, what they need to get out of the trade negotiation with the EU. Um, in a normal trade negotiation scenario, uh, it's kind of like two communities on either side of a river thinking, you know, it'd be really great to build a bridge. Um, and if we do build that bridge, what might be the uh, economic benefits flowing from that? Uh, this situation is a bit the reverse, and picking up on some co uh, comments this morning, where the bridge is already there, and you're really thinking, well, how do, much do I depend upon that bridge? What of that bridge do I need to keep in place in order to keep on doing my, running my business the way I do? And so from a, a business point of view, uh, you know, to what extent am I dependent upon the labor market as it currently stands? To what extent do I depend upon the regulatory framework, as we said this morning? Uh, to what extent are the inputs in my manufacturing process uh, flowing from the UK to continental Europe um, and kind of doing an inventory about that. And I um, echo the comments of this morning, again, of the need to continue engaging with the uh, British civil service that's going to be engaged in the negotiations, but also probably with your counterparts on continent, in continental Europe um, about w which bits of this are really necessary to us and therefore what is a priority list that we're presenting to the government because you know, having been uh, engaged in the CETA negotiations for a number of years, part of that process is engaging with um, industry to really understand what are the 
you know, necessary, what are the bright lines for the beekeepers? What are the bright lines for the trains? What are the bright lines for, uh, for the financial services industry? And so government needs that in order to go in equipped with a, with a uh, sort of overall battle plan. So that's the first point about uh, doing that inventory and being engaged. The second point is uh, the European Union is a complicated beast. Um, it's not just that this is a negotiation uh, about the, uh, it's not just a negotiation about the UK and EU relationship, it's a negotiation about the future of the EU uh, and how the EU is going to continue to stay together as a political unit, so they're keeping that in mind. But just from a, a negotiating perspective, one isn't negotiating with a single state, one's negotiating with 27, or as we were with 28 member states, all of whom have their uh, particular interests, their particular economies, they're running at different speeds, but also institutionally within the EU, uh, without doing a course on EU law, but um, as most in the room will probably know, there's the European Commission, but there's, which is basically the uh, you know, operational side, the ones who aren't, one is actually facing in, the, fa facing in the negotiations, the European Council, which provides the executive level uh, direction to you know, the negotiating mandate, uh, but is, continues to be consulted, and the European Parliament, uh, which is directly elected and has its own review mandate, including at the end of the process, without, without even talking about the uh, national parliaments who also have to approve. And uh, those, um, in the course of a negotiation, those different bits of the EU properly um, uh, so-called can have very different political um, positions vis-a-vis -vis the negotiations. So to take an example, uh, I was heavily involved in the investment uh, aspect of the negotiations. The uh, many member states, um, certainly Western European member states, had a very liberal uh, policy approach towards investment, the investment side of the agreement. Um, many members of the European Parliament had a uh, very hostile approach or attitude towards the investment element of the agreement, and the European Commission was brokering that somehow in the middle. So you have to you know, think and engage with those different aspects of the European Union as opposed to uh, with, a unitary, uh, with a unitary state. Um, um, I mean, I could go on about that, but just to speak about the process, um, without getting into most of the technicalities, but there typically is, in a free trade agreement, a consultation phase, a kind of technical scoping out phase. Uh, usually, it's a, as I say, one is going to build a bridge, so what, what do we stand to benefit from this? You know, what are the perspective here? It may be a little bit more. What do we need to hold on to? Um, and then uh, initial technical discussions, uh, the uh, establishment of a mandate, and then you start to uh, actually negotiate. And the negotiation then kind of fans out over a number of tables. So you have your temporary entry table, you have your public procurement table, you have your uh, national treatment market access trade and goods table, you have your investment table, all of which will be staffed by a different uh, team uh, coming in from different parts of the bureaucracy. And so, you know, at any one round of negotiations, you can have 50 people uh, uh, traveling to engage because they're all going to be in different meetings at the same time over the course of that day. And, you know, you have a, a kind of shuttling back and forth between different capitals for each round with technical work that goes on in the meanwhile, ending with an agreement in principle, um, and then finally a legal scrub, and then uh, where we're at in the CETA, the um, um, approvals process, uh, the signature and then the ratification. So it's, it's, I mean, in the CETA context, we started in 2009 with technical discussions, and uh, we are now entering into provisional entry into force. Um, right. So. There was no transitional, was it? Were there no. Transitions? You didn't, did you, was there a point at which, without all the detail, was there the equivalent that, that is talked about in this process, the Brexit process, of an outline agreement? Because the Article 50 says we need to sort of, you know, agree the framework for the future relationship. Was there an equivalent in which it said what this agreement is going to be is basically give us reciprocal investment rights, it's going to open up public procurement, we're going to have a lot of measures for individual industries to make sure that there's free and fair competition. Was there, was there something like that? So you all knew what you were working towards, or did you just get straight into the weeds and start haggling over telephone number portability arrangements and such like? Well, each side is going to have a negotiating mandate at the beginning, which is going to set out what are the main goals that seek to be achieved 
Um, and then it's a question of getting them. And you know, uh, usually you start with the easy stuff, and then you move further and further into the hard stuff. But it, but it's technical. And in the context of uh, a normal free trade negotiation, there isn't any there there. There's nothing in place yet. And one seeking to you know build the bridge. Um, so the added complication of this situation is um, you sort of want to tear down the bridge, uh, but you want to keep part of it. But you need to have you know some kind of interim bits that. We're trying to tear a bridge down and build a new bridge that's a little bit thinner and narrow. Yeah, you know, you're going from a, an, yeah. an eight lane or to a two lane. <laughs> it's, 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 it's sort of helpful. Um, it's and just in terms of the meeting schedule, you said they multiple tables and things. I mean, I just want to have a really literal picture of what, what you mean. So how often were the two sides meeting? Um, it depended on the phase of the negotiation, but uh, it could typically be sort of every three or four months. Um, that seems painfully slow, if I'm honest. But every, every time, in months. every phase of a negotiation, one is going back with, OK, this is what they want. Can we? You know, say on temporary entry, this is what they're saying is their offer. Can we live with that? And one goes into consultations with industry, with other layer, levels of government, because there's going yeah. to be diff different layers of government. Uh, one considers what is our, you know, alternative. The, you run it through your legal services to make sure. I mean, I was one of the people uh, on the legal side saying, no, we can't do that. There are different approaches, too. Um, I was always in the room in the negotiation as counsel because that was Canada's approach. We thought it was more practical to have the lawyers right there so then, you know, if there was a red flag to be raised. Other, the European Union in its approach tends not to have the lawyers there and they <laughs> engage them in afterwards. Oh, yeah. And there's, you know, pour et yeah. contre for that. Okay, does anybody have a specific question for Christophe before we get into the sort of the, the, the risks that I know everyone else um, is going to be? Specifics on, okay, quick one. Uh, so just wait for the microphone. Have we got a mic to rush over here? It's coming. It's coming. Brett, bringing it over to you. Yep. From your experience and looking ahead, what would you say would be the biggest hurdle in the negotiating process with the UK? I can't speak for specific industries. Um, I think that the analysis has to be done on the basis of specific industries. I wouldn't speak of hurdle. I would just speak of difference. I think that when one is uh, entering into a trade negotiation, one's thinking about uh, what are the economic benefits to be drawn from this. Um, whereas in this particular situation, uh, you, are, you have the disentangling aspect of it alongside the, the building. And so I guess the question is to what extent there is going to be uh, thinking on the European side about uh, what they need to do to preserve themselves institutionally vis-a-vis -vis, um, what economic benefits they want to continue to draw from um, relations with, with the UK. I think, I think you put your finger on because most of the economists sitting around saying you just would go, you would just reinvent the bridge that you first had rather than reduce the size of it. So, it's, 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 and the need for the EU to show there's a difference between the bridges is obviously quite a big thing. OK, I want to get my other three panellists uh, to talk about risks. We've heard from Stefan already, so he will go last. Um, Catherine, yeah. you have thought quite a bit about Brexit and the city. We're going to start on risks, not opportunities. Yeah. Uh, the key is to tell us things we haven't already heard, because we know that there's a sort of general worry about passports and what will happen. But just a little more detail than that. What are you losing sleep over? Well, a number of things, because this is an immensely complicated situation. But for me, speaking through from, from the perspective of the financial and related professional services sector, I think the biggest worry for me would be common to other sectors, and that is that politics will be put above pragmatism and that there will be unnecessary harm. What politics above pragmatism and prosperity and that there will be unnecessary harm to the real economy and to real people. And real people in uh, Europe, as EU27, as much as in London, people who won't be able to, thinking from the perspective again of our sector, people in Hamburg or wherever who won't be able to rely on their insurance contracts working, people who might not be able to access the finance for their small business. So uh, 
I think, for a good settlement, which would be a settlement which works for Europe, EU27, as much as it works for, uh, uh, for the UK, for our sector, it's tremendously important that there should be continued full two-way access to those markets that we all need. Now, that would have to be on a different basis to the basis that we've got at the moment, and a lot of research has been done to think about uh, what that might be. Our sector has been working very much together through the trade associations, uh, through um, the individual institutions, pooling knowledge and ex um, experience, and a group which we support, the International Regulatory Strategy Group, has come up with a proposal for mutual recognition, uh, which gives a number of options which could be considered. So, this, a bespoke basis for full two-way access would be tremendously important. Um, but then, uh, a second issue which really concerns me is the need for time. Um, a transition period, first of all, to... Uh, um, well, to work through wherever we're going to get to, but to give us the time to negotiate the proper arrangement for where we're going to get to, and then to deal with the actual mechanics of getting there. And I am worried at the moment that there is a risk that that transition may not be, uh, may not be offered. I think... May not be offered or may not be may long not be enough. Agreed, or, may not be long enough. Well, right. I, I think... May not it, be agreed. Yeah. Right. Um, I'd be very concerned at anything which led to fragmentation or disruption of the market uh, or which reduced liquidity because I go back to this point that we would be harming. But one may think in big figures, you may think this is the sector that provides a lot of tax, 72 uh, billion tax to the country, etc. Actually, I think you need to think of it in terms of what it means for real people, real businesses, both in Europe <coughs> and, in, and in London. Um. How many different businesses do you represent? I mean, we, we, we tend to think of financial services as an industry, but actually there, it's not, it's not one, is it? It's really multiple. It, it is multiple. It's uh, uh, the whole range of, of banks, asset managers, um, insurance companies. Insurance. There's the infrastructure, and we can come on to clearing in a minute, and it gets very technical, but I have a, a, another concern that we will be... Uh, uh, risking unnecessary disruption to the financial markets and increasing systemic risk if we split clearing. So there's the, uh, the, the infrastructure, there's the stock exchange, um, there's the accountants, lawyers. And is it just, just out of interest, are there some of those industries who are more worried or more ready to move than others? I mean, is... That's an interesting question because even within the same sector, even within the same type of institution, institution, because of the nature of people's business, it will impact on them differently. What we're seeing at the moment is people are making contingency arrangements so that they will be able to operate um, on day one, post-Brexit. In order to implement those contingency arrangements, they're moving a few jobs, but we're not at the moment seeing any big right. change. Uh, uh, clearly, there will be adjustments in the sector, but... Uh, uh, at the moment, we're it, not it, it's, 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 it's sort of opening the, yeah. the office rather than moving the office. Yeah. Um, and just last one, you, you said people's insurance may not apply or something, and I, I, I was picked up on that. What, what, what would be going wrong? I mean, people have contracts. Let's just be clear contracts will still apply after you have a contract with someone in Greece or in Germany. There is no change to the law of contracts or to the sanctity of those contracts or to the currency in which those contracts are denominated. Contracts carry on after Brexit, right? There's nothing... Or, or, is, or are there going to be contracts that don't... private contracts that don't carry on? It will partly depend on how the institution providing the insurance is uh, authorised and whether they're allowed to provide services to uh, European citizens or not. And I'm looking round in the hope that there is someone here who's an expert on insurance, but there will be a number of implications where, you, where if you're not a, a, a regulated European insurer, you may not be able to pay out. Right. So you might have a contract with the company, and that company is no longer allowed to provide the service for which you're contracted to them. Yes. That's right. I, th I think it's implications like that which we all need to be looking through our sector, mm -hmm. identifying, and then pointing out to the legislators and the regulators. Crystal? 
I was just going to say, as, I mean, as a lawyer, the, it's, not just, it's not that the contract doesn't apply. It's just, has there been, for example, a fundamental change in circumstances that could lead to you know, someone resigning from the contract because all of a sudden it's impossible to perform? And you know, one has to, uh, it depends on what the outcome of the negotiations is, but uh, there could very well be a number of claims in that regard. OK, so what we're saying is you don't just have to look at all the laws that might change with the Great Repeal Bill and all of that. You need to be aware of contracts that you have. Absolutely. Yeah. Whose circumstances might change mm -hmm. post Brexit. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK. Paul, what are the things you're losing sleep over? Well, I mean, it's... Uh, businesses thrive and survive for decades because they adapt to challenge and change. So the reality is uh, I'd be prepared to present an Oscar to just about every CEO in the UK for their optimism and determination in the face of adversity. We have, as a, an economy showed, great resilience. But we thrive on growing our businesses. We thrive on creating jobs. And actually what we want as businesses is actually common across 28 countries, mm -hmm. which is we want our businesses to succeed on a local and global basis. Uh, we love creating jobs, we love creating opportunities and adapting to technology. We like continuity and we love certainty. Put the other way, uncertainty is the enemy of business growth and investment. So if you say that there, there is therefore an issue about if I'm going to make a long-term plan, I need to know, uh, be able to make some assumptions about what the external environment is. So critical to that, number one, is what are my financial assumptions? I need to know what's the deal, what's the trade deal, what's the tariff non-tariff barriers I have to deal with. The second thing I need to know is uh, how long have I got? And this I think is really, really important because an implementation period or a transition point in the future uh, creates many different options in terms of how to deal with it. If I don't know, then as a board director, my fiduciary duty is to not just have a contingency plan, but implement it fast enough to be ready for day one, day two. That doesn't just apply to the UK. It applies to the 28 countries in Europe with whom we have different sorts of relationships. And I think uh, few people, I, I am a bit concerned, not enough people understand the practical detail of business mm -hmm. in, in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and if you look, uh, I was talking last night just about a simple uh, uh, computer chip. And if you look at the number of EU and non-EU countries, the number of regulations, judiciary, advisors involved in making that go from the, fa the factory floor to the consumer, it is phenomenal. So I think uh, we have to be able to, we have to step up our game in terms of education. And I would say, uh, if you said, what do I really have most concern about? And that is about human relationships. I think, uh, and I know you might have touched on this earlier, but I'm, I was with my opposite 27, uh, industry president a few weeks ago in Malta. And we had our meeting, it was about three hours long. Two and a quarter hours had nothing to do with Brexit. That's to do with how do we ensure Europe is successful as a region long term. So I can assure you with the other 27 countries, number one on their values and priorities is sustained peace. Mm. And number two is a successful, strong Europe. And by the way, as a UK businessman, a strong Europe is of vital importance to me and to many, but not all, UK companies. Those who trade, it matters, a lot do. So I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that a great outcome for us isn't a strong Europe, it's a stronger Europe. Because a stronger Europe that grows more is a better opportunity for the UK. Uh, and I think as we go into these, uh, I'm wary of, it's about a trade negotiation. Mm -hmm. It can only be about a trade negotiation if you have the relationships and you understand and respect the other side. And that's why we were really pleased with the Prime Minister's Article 50 letter because it went an awful lot further to acknowledge and recognise what was important to our European neighbours. And I do think it's worth reminding ourselves, it's a simple expression, but the UK is not leaving Europe. Unless there is some massive geological event, <laughs> we are living, these are our next door neighbours for the foreseeable future. So relationships will be really critical. And it is quite difficult to perform great trade negotiations without great relationships. That doesn't mean okay. you're hugging each other, 
but a prof I would just say it finally, trade negotiations is a professional sport. It's dog eat dog. And at the end of the day, we're going to be up against the best, most practiced, most professional negotiators in the world. So we do everything we can to create the conditions for a successful outcome. What length of transition does, does the CBI want? What, would, what are you thinking of? Three years? Five years? Well, you know, I, I think it, 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 <coughs> again, until this all takes shape, uh, I would say our immediate issues are clarity through the next 18 months. With, I, I should have said, number one, right across our membership, is uh, respect and support for three and a half million workers that we have who come from the EU. And I think that's got nothing to do, personally, nothing to do with all the rest of this stuff. If it was me, I would give them confidence assurance right now. i keep the lawyers well away from it. I'd say, just look after the people the way you would consist with your values. Now get on with the rest. Uh, then in terms of the transition period, I think we have got to work our way into that. It's definitely not months. It's definitely not a year. I think it will depend on how complicated we choose to make the deal. If we, if we keep it up at a pretty high altitude, to a great extent, reassigning what we have today, then the period could maybe be two years. If it gets more complicated and it requires investment, whether it's in Germany or Poland or France or the UK, investment takes time to put in place. Uh, and what we certainly can't have is a cliff edge. You touched earlier on this. I think it's really important people understand no deal means you go home on Friday and you've little ability to trade on Monday morning. If you can't move goods out of this country, you know, you come to a halt. So you do need the practical. So we need to know what does day, the day after look like. That's just realities. Mm. But I would say again, the business community by and large comes across as massively enthusiastic and optimistic because that's the way they're made. And just, I, I, I'll put this one to you, Stefan, as well. Is there a... Is there something between cliff edge no deal and, and a kind of a framework deal? Is there something that says, OK, we haven't managed to agree on a framework deal. This is not working. It is a divorce. It is a hard, a hard Brexit than anyone wants. But we will have a kind of patch deal that just says the planes can fly and the, and, and the lorries can, can move on Monday. But it's not a deal. I mean, and it's not a framework. Is there, does that exist? Something that's just slightly softened the edge of the tragic kind of. Well, I pick up Catherine's point. I mean, at the end of the day, if pragmatism prevails, which is what business people are fundamentally yeah. about, there are all sorts of options. If politics prevails, you yeah. won't be flying. Right. Mm -hmm. Stefan, is there, in your view, is there something that, that, that gives you a sort of a Monday morning deal so that the planes can still fly? Or. <laughs> If I listen to my membership, uh, I think the, the, the uh, uh, hard Brexit and, 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 and nicest uh, uh, thing on the other side is taken out and really see out the business perceptions is there something in between. What are the biggest concerns of German businesses? Uh, we made several polls, not on our own, but uh, together with companies. Number one seems to be that. Uh, although uh, the integrity of the internal market is challenged by, by uh, uh, some, somebody or something in this uh, uh, issue, uh, especially the question of what, what is doing, what people are doing with the, uh, with the people from the EU working in the UK in, in their companies is a really big concern which troubles them because they're losing uh, this, this high qualified work so in this traditional uh, appearance. There is a big expectation that we have fewer trade, fewer investment. That is quite clearly outspoken among our membership with one exception. Sorry, uh, everybody, the vast majority is expecting the, the financial markets to get up in Germany as a result of Brexit and expecting uh, 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 some ex uh, movement from, from uh, from the city to other uh, uh, places. There is a debate among our membership, where, uh, all, but in every third um, member, that how to move a country out, uh, the, the company out of uh, uh, the UK. But uh, the good news is two thirds are, are, are stuck with, within any, by any means uh, uh, here. Complexity and cost, we hear every day from our membership. So for a question, simple, uh, question who may be simple, um, I have a limited, uh, 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 as, as a legal status of my company, what will happen to me? And customers are asking us, 
hey, I have a contract with the limited. I hear something on the daily basis on, on, on this Brexit thing, stuff. What does that mean to me? Or if you see uh, the lovely co-determination uh, issue of company with European legal statuses here uh, uh, in the UK, um, uh, even trade unions are a bit concerned, are we getting gaining more rights at the end or uh, 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 losing uh, 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 some rights? There is a big um, uh, uh, new uh, issue. There are, Brex for, Bre uh, there, there are Brex Brexit task forces in every major uh, uh, company. And the concern, the, the bigger the company is, the greater is the concern. We have two, two major issues. We have the, um, from very prominent car building here. Um, but uh, if I look on, on revenues and, and, and sales, they, are, uh, they have a very important issue uh, here. And if I look on the people working, services is, is, is even bigger. So uh, it's not just only financial markets uh, and insurances. For I was a supervising Deutsche, Deutsche Bahn, which with Arriva has a, uh, has a small, tiny company uh, you probably use uh, on, on a daily uh, basis. And all in, in these small and bigger, are they, they are checking uh, possible outcomes. So um, uh, lawyers uh, are, are probably the most profiting uh, um, uh, profession uh, <laughs> on, on this case of uncertainty. So there is much concern, but not, not a feeling of catastrophe. Um, and and there's, there, there's a great commitment to the market, but uh, to the market here in the UK and to the direct, foreign direct investment in this country. On the other hand, there's a clear understanding that is not just uh, uh, this one market, that there are 27 other markets to fulfil. And just, just on the car one, OK, so this, this has been much spoken about. The car part classically goes backwards and forwards five times before it gets put into an assembled vehicle. If there are rules of origin and customs bureaucracies at a border to get those things across, that's going to make the, the lean, mean machines that we know these supply chains are very difficult to sustain. You have twice said, Stefan, that the UK, German manufacturers want to maintain the integrity of the single market. When they are faced with the possibility that to maintain the integrity of the single market, whatever that means, there is a customs border that their car plant, their BMW plant in Oxford, has to have, is cut off from the supply chain that they have created. What will they say? Will they say to the German government, no, look, obviously we have to have a deal that doesn't require customs arrangements for car parts, or will they say, oh, the integrity of the single market's important, we'll just let Mini go and, and, and Ox Cowley go? What, what, what will they say? Um. I don't know what they're saying to the German government. They probably will communicate with uh, Michel Barnier, uh, as they already have, uh, uh, have done. And their communication uh, publicly and probably internally is that key, the key issue, uh, uh, integrity. But they have a clear understanding that Michel Barnier shall not forget th their special interests. And that will be, th th that will be out of deal-making, to bring these two principles together um, what policy shall not expect is that the business interests are breaking up. Uh, 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 we want to do business with the UK, not by all means and not by all regulations, but uh, th 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 there's a strong push. And um, uh, there are some wishes, some expectations, not everybody will, uh, will be fulfilled. But I think it, it is, uh, every business shall go to uh, the European or national uh, partners and try to, to line it up. And, and finally, when a deal makes it a deal, uh, it will be a deal. If it comes to the financial services, I think we have, to, to, we have, to, we have two um, uh, things on the floor. The one is competition, uh, and the other is financial market stability. I'm not talking about competition, uh, um, because we may have different interests in this room, but I will clearly line out where we have a, a big support, not only within the financial services market, that, we, that the, deal, the, the, the deal of the integration of the uh, uh, located financial services here has completely in line for capital and liquidity recruitment uh, with, uh, with our expectation of uh, uh, um, uh, financial stability. This is understandable, and this is probably something which we do have into uh, consideration. Even if somebody is only talking about con uh, competition, I think what we need is an arrangement of transition that, 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 that uh, delivers fair competition between ins and out, but delivers primary, the primary uh, purpose will be financial market stability.
think the thing to keep in mind is that it's, it's not just uh, the economic relationship with the UK or the political stability of, of, of Europe, um, but that that political stability within Europe, the integrity of the European Union, also has an economic in, in, implication for, for example, German industry. Um, and so that's, that's an economic analysis yeah. as much as a political one too. Before I throw to the, the floor, and we're allowed to talk opportunities as well as risks, I just want to ask each of the panel in a sentence to say whether they think the process that we're about to embark on and business role in it, is it going to be a process in which Everybody's trying to avoid disaster, make it as smooth as possible while maintaining the integrity of the single market for their side and as open a trade as possible as everybody wants and as compatible with the integrity of the European single market. Is it about making that process work or is it going to be about individual companies saying, hey, hang on, there's a deal we can do. If we can shut out the Brits on this, we can stitch up, you know, the rest of Europe because the Brits are now going to be at a disadvantage. Is this doggy dog business intra-business intra fighting over competitive advantage, which a lot of trade deals are, or is this about everybody knuckling down to try and make the thing work as smoothly as possible? How much, in other words, is this negotiation a constructive one, and how much of it a sort of variable sum game, and how much of it is being treated as a zero sum game in which we're all rivals here, or individual businesses are? Catherine, I know you have to go fairly shortly, so I'm going to let you go first. Well, I think we're in for a fairly rocky ride with the negotiations. I think we'll see political posturing and the press making um, a meal of that. I mean, we've seen some of that already. Um, I think there has never been a more important time because of the complexity of what we're facing. Pascal Lamy said uh, it was like extracting an egg from an omelette. And I think that's a very good analogy. I think just thinking from our sector, the complexities involved and the risks if we get it wrong mean that there's never been a more important time for people with calm, pragmatic heads to work together, to speak together across the national borders, uh, to work out what the issues are and then the most sensible solution. Yes, of course, there'll be competition. There always is. Indeed, on the question of jobs moving from London elsewhere and all back again, that's been happening over the, over the centuries. And of course, that will happen now. But let's focus on the really important point, getting a good solution for all of us. Uh, it's going to be a win-win and not a lose-lose. Paul, how much jockeying do you see going on? Well, I'd start and say I passionately believe that the best deal will be achieved through, number one, the voices of business across Europe and the UK, Romanian United. I think the greatest threat to success is fragmentation either by company, by sector, or by country. So, so I would say uh, we, we need to recognize this is complex, challenging, enormously intellectually demanding. So all that we can do to help all of our governments <coughs> navigate this uh, will make a big difference. We have been very clear as the CBI that given the nature of this task and its complexity, it would just be a huge missed opportunity of the UK government not to engage the business community in helping them with solutions to problems which are predominantly in the world of business. Certainly, the great trade negotiators in the world that we've talked to all would say they wouldn't dream of doing a trade negotiation without understanding the views and priorities of business. So I would say that I think we can make a big difference. I, I absolutely believe there's a possibility of a good deal for everyone, and that's what I think we owe to the next generation. Mm. Equally, I think there's a risk that it goes off to the side, uh, and collectively we should be concerned about that and doing our best to avoid it. Stefan. Um, uh, I, I want to put some water in the wine. Um, my, my experience from CETA and TTIP negotiation is that transparency might, might challenge us uh, more than we wanted. If, if I see the communication of, of Michel Barnier, about the tra transparent negotiation, probably everything, every detail will be published somewhere, somehow, per perhaps the uh, intentionally or not intentionally. That makes um, uh, a bargaining uh, much more complicated. Diplomatic exchange, which is uh, viewed on television, probably will, will not deliver uh, success. So this, uh, this negotiation probably will have much more pressure from, from nations, from sectors, from businesses, we have to keep us, to, uh, we have to limit that. On the other hand, I do not believe 
that we have can make secret negotiations. This is 20th century uh, t uh, 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 pre um, uh, pre digitalization uh, uh, thinking, uh, and we will have we will have we will we probably will. This will be the first um, uh, trade deal or trade and investment deal between the EU and others, which be, will be com uh, completely transparent. And therefore, actually, I see much much more bumps in the road uh, uh, than, than we would love to see normally on, on, the, on, on, this, on, on a deal. Yeah. Okay, look, any comments from the floor? Catherine, I don't know when exactly you need That's to go, but if, if, if you need to go, um, run off. Okay, any... Risks or opportunities, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear from some of the industries here as to what, uh, what, what you see as the risks. This is the Brexit exchange, so come on, you're not as relaxed as, uh, as that. Anybody who's not a lawyer here? Oh, yes, over there. We'll take, uh, take one there. Mark Flessing, Chief Executive of Pocket. We are, uh, according to The Economist, one of the fastest growing uh, house builders in London today. Um, I reckon that 75% of my building sites are populated by Eastern Europeans. Mm. Nobody in the construction and development industry is prepared to say it publicly very loudly, um, but the figure of 10% departure of uh, Eastern Europeans is, is, is absolutely minor to what actually is going on on the ground. We reckon it's probably more like 30%. What, 30% what, of what? Of, 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 the, of the total Eastern European workforce in London today on the construction sites in London. And if you reckon that so they... 30% have what? Have left? 30% have already left. Have already left? Have already left. And if you reckon that they probably make up somewhere around 40 to 60% of the construction workforce on the building sites, you can see why... Some developers are now having to set up marketing suites in order to compete for Eastern European labour to come and work on their building sites. Again, nobody's talking about this, but it is a very, very, very serious problem indeed. Paul? So, uh, I think it's... The most important thing is that after decades of avoiding it, we're talking about the value that people bring to our economy and society. We've avoided that conversation for a long time. There are a lot of realities, but there's two drivers of departures. One driver is the money I'm repatriating to my family is 20% less than it was a few weeks ago. That's a big force. I think the second thing is families need to plan, which again I would say is uncertainty is the enemy of progress and opportunity and there is no hope of delivering the UK construction house building programme unless we address this issue. Do, do, do you see it as a money thing? Is that why they're leaving? Do they, do they tell you why they're, they're No, they're actually, what's interesting, I've been going to all our building sites. We're on site in 12 places in London at the moment, and the number one reason is not money. The number one reason is that they are hurt. Mm. They're upset, they don't okay. feel welcome anymore, and they do feel they have choices. And what's really interesting is the number of people who, who said to me, you know, we came here because there were, some, there were members of the Vanguard who came here 10 years ago and they told us back, back in Krakow that we should come to London. But those people are now telling us we shouldn't stay here. And we forget at our peril that these diasporas actually do have Vanguards. They have groups of people who lead them to the next place. They're not going back to Poland. When you ask the question, they're going to Sweden, they're going to Holland, they're going to Germany. They're going because they're hurt, not because of the money. I think it goes back to what you said before, Paul, that people are paramount and we ought to be looking after our people. And we've benefited so much from the international workforce that we've had uh, that some way of making them feel, uh, continue to feel welcome and also ensuring that we can still access the workforce that we need is really crucial. And I am sorry, I will have to leave it. Thank you very much. We'll carry on the conversation for another... Uh, five or ten minutes. Yeah, just, uh, one. yeah go ahead, just Christoph. Th I think this also illustrates uh, how this negotiation is different from the usual trade negotiations because um, in terms of the movement of peoples in those trade negotiations, you're usually talking about temporary entry of key personnel, you know, kind of technicians or leading managers for certain periods of time. You're not talking about longer term construction labor, you know, workers coming. So this is a, a different uh, s scenario. They're completely different industries that reflect the free movement of people that's been in place for the last 40 years. I just want to go back to, I want to go back to you, and to what, what is your industry doing about it? Because it, it is clear there isn't an appetite for there to be the same uh, inward flow of, 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 of construction workers that we've been used to. The kind of the, the stated desire is that the British manufacture some of their own construction workers to take the empty posts that'll be left. What, is, is that happening? 
So I took Sajid Javid to uh, uh, the modular factory that we're using to build 50% of our pipeline up through modular. We're the fastest growing user of modular construction in the UK. And he asked me with great excitement uh, who populated this factory in Bedford. And I told him uh, unambiguously that 70% of the workforce was Polish. And he didn't like that answer. So uh, th what is the industry doing? Um, too little. And I think one of the reasons why I'm here at Brexit Exchange today is because it's very hard for the average CEO of a FTSE listed company to stand up and make these points. It's, it's also very hard for them to make these points through their trade organizations because their trade organizations now, and particularly in the way in which the referendum was managed by trade organizations, are seen to have um, shot, shot, shot their best ammunition. They, they just haven't got the standing with the media and with the public at large. So they new, need new ways of expressing the technical and logistical uh, commercial problems that they're faced with. And I think that's going to have to be one of your biggest roles with Brexit, Brexit Exchange, to get people to talk about the internal analysis that they're doing, all that money they're spending on consultancy reports, and to find a way of making that public in a way that doesn't, uh, uh, d d that doesn't hurt them commercially in public. Mm -hmm. Paul? I mean, I would, I mean, certainly in, in terms of uh, CBI membership, our members are very clear the reason that their membership, one of the principal reasons is that the CBI can be the voice mm. on behalf of the whole UK economy and raise these, these sorts of points. Now, what I would say is there is no such thing as a sector issue in isolation. If we don't have effective financial services industry in the UK, if that has problems, it will affect our house building. If we don't have the right sort of manufacturing supply chain here. So, so being able to put this in the context of the whole economy, I think, is really important. And I think we're well past, all of us, we should be well past, have been afraid of actually telling the truth about the realities. Been able to do that by way of example and specifics rather than generalizations. And I would say, I think the, the media are actually open to real stories. They're not open to what I would call moaning. But if you say, here is an example of exactly what is happening in this part of London, this part of Manchester, I think the media is interested as they ever were. But it, it's, it's about fact and evidence, which to a great extent I would encourage all of us in terms of our issues, pull the facts together, pull the evidence, make the case. So I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I, I think you, you raised an interesting point because maybe the, 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 the CBIs and the equivalents, maybe there is less credibility because the referendum was lost, the public clearly said, we don't want to believe your fear, your, your scare stories. And so it, it maybe better does come from the individual businesses saying, I've got a headache, you know, but a third of my staff are leaving. Or, but but there isn't the capacity right. on the other side to listen. Mm -hmm. to, I mean, if you look at, we have just 190,000 organisations of membership, and there's a tonne of other medium and small sized guys yeah. part of it. There isn't the human capacity to deal with something of this scale. But I do think the better we can articulate our issues and tell the stories to help people understand. And I think, by the way, I think, the, I think we have got issues in this nation, but four out of five people are employed by private companies. Private companies make a big difference to a lot of communities. So I think yet there are issues with business, but I don't think, you know, I think right across Europe and the world, you know, the business brand is a lot weaker than it was, but that shouldn't stop us doing what we believe in. Just from a practical point of view, too, apart from the issue of, of uh, um, you know, dealing with the media or selling a story to the media, it, it's dealing with the government. And I know from having worked within a government that there is limited capacity to take in messages, and it is effective to kind of band together with people who have common interests and bring that message to the people who are going to be engaged in the negotiations and say, this is really what we need. And that includes, I think, in that in this context, banding together, you know, a, between between uh, British businesses and, and continental businesses to say, okay, this is because in turn, from the negotiation point of view, if both sides are saying actually we need this, uh, it's going to be easier, I think, for the negotiators to come together. Right. I want to take a couple more points and then we'll move on to a quick discussion. Yes, sir, there and then the um, lady to the left. Yeah, go ahead. I think the point made, made about the hurt of the immigrants who are working here is very well made because no one has really addressed that. And my surname's Mashinsky. My father 
was given a home here after the Second World War, as were 250,000 other Poles who, uh, at a time when Britain was bankrupt and didn't have any homes, and uh, you know that history is incredibly important. Um, I'm going to be actually taking this into my own hands, and, and I'm paying out of my own pocket for an ad to appear on June the 4th in Poland to make a point very much on this subject. And I think it's not just Brexit uh, exchange being a benefit for, for lawyers because there's going to be a lot of legal work out there, but I actually think we need to embrace communications as a country to talk the, to the people of Europe. So I'd, I'd encourage yeah. you to do the same. OK, point well made. And then we had a, a lady with a hand up next. Hi, I've got a question specifically for Stefan. Um, there's been some discussion of Germany possibly changing its labour laws to entice um, financial institutions to, um, to, well, to Frankfurt specifically. Um, I wonder whether you supported that move and what the view of German companies was on that. And you're, you're, you are? Sorry, my name's Lucy McNulty. I'm a Brexit correspondent at Financial News. There is an initiative by the state of Hessen, which has not been taken up by the second chamber. So uh, uh, I don't see a, ch uh, a chance that this special preferences will come into legislation uh, soon. You don't see a chance? No, I, 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 I do not see a chance. No. If I were Prime Minister of Hessen, I probably would have thought of something else. But um, uh, in fact, uh, his partners haven't taken up his, his proposal. Right. So. Uh, the, the, uh, to just to give you some uh, pr legal proposals can be made by the German Bundestag and by the second chamber called Bundesrat, which is the representation of the 16 lender. And this was one proposal which uh, has not found the majority. And so uh, I, don't see, uh, I don't see that this is, comes too close to the uh, 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 change of the legal situation. But to be very serious, of course there will be initiatives out of the marketplaces in Amsterdam uh, or in Paris and others just to attract businesses from, from, from here. Uh, we would be naive to, 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 to <laughs> yeah. say that, that, that this is different, but this has nothing to do with the negotiations of Brexit. This has something to do with what Paul said that um, uh, uncertainty is, is the enemy of, of stable businesses. So there, there, there are uh, on the financial markets many who think uh, uh, about the timeline um, uh, until a, a final decision, maybe beyond uh, the 16 months, and what does that mean for our businesses? This is, this is quite true. And I'd like to line up another thing is which we have to clearly speak out, that there are some in Europe uh, who believe that, uh, 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 that one of the, the, the advantages of Brexit is the lack of competition. <laughs> it's, it's not that everybody in business loves competition, we, we know that, but as business association we are clearly committed not to monopolies but to, to really clear competition. But um, um, we, have, we will hear voices during the debate who said, uh, um, 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 okay, the internal market is nice, but it's nicer if we can uh, for our company to exclude them. This is this belongs to the reality. This is this is not just a play game. It's about economic interests that may 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 have go in conflict. Therefore, actually, I very much support Paul that we have within economic association and business association have have to deliver uh, recommendations to our governments or as Business Europe uh, to to the EU Commission which consider not only one single company, but business interests in general. OK, I want to, um, I just want to finish this panel before we talk about what Brexit exchange can do for you. Um, finish this panel with focusing on the positives, opportunities. Now, is there anybody out there, I'm going to ask each of these guys to uh, identify opportunities. Are there things? So an opportunity we've heard about is the opportunity for British construction business to train up uh, a workforce here that may be... Uh, great for some of the uh, underemployed people in the UK. Do any of you want to talk about or mention or have in mind opportunities? We haven't talked about trade deals much outside the, uh, outside the EU. Do, do, does anybody want to nominate their opportunities? Tumbleweed blows across the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, Paul from British Sugar. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, is a really interesting market, I think, in context of Brexit. And I think we'll uh, look at it and talk about it more over the next two years. And the reason I think that is because um, you have been talking on the panel about how people interact with government and how government listens to various people. And there are lots of interest groups. 
the, the sugar market in the UK, um, there is British sugar, which produces about half the sugar that's consumed in the UK. Behind us, there are 3,500 farmers, so we'll be talking to government. 25% comes from France, Germany, uh, and across Northern Europe, where they also grow beet. They'll be talking to their government, so I know for a fact that the French sugar industry are lobbying the French government to retain access to the British market. It's a very attractive market to them. And then 25% is imported, um, some of it from Malawi, for example, where it's a hugely powerful developmental tool for the Malawians. Um, and a lot of education and healthcare, jobs and currency depends on a trade regime which allows sugar to come into the UK. So they're going to be lobbying um, through the uh, relevant channels into government as well. And then the imports come in through Tate and Lyle in London, who will be lobbying too. So all of those people are talking to government. Um, and the thing I've heard today is mostly about risk. I think there's absolutely an opportunity for the UK government to write a sugar policy for the UK, which is focused on what's best for the UK, and we would absolutely support that. In the short term, though, most of the conversation today has been about the transition risk. So it feels like rather than try to um, tinker with that regime and change different things, the, the overwhelming need for business is to um, guarantee that we can keep trade flowing, that we can keep the status quo. And then once we've done that, then, fine, let's move on and look at some of the opportunities and pick those up and, and work out what balance of those interests we want to embrace. So, Paul, sorry, you're in favour of working out the transition, but you yeah. don't want that to be the end. You, you do want to think about the new regime that might... Yeah, absolutely. So, I think there's... So, sugar agriculture, if you broaden it to agriculture, if you look at agriculture as a whole, the trade policy of the UK with regard to oranges, for example, yeah. or rice, which is something I know something about, the UK trade policy on rice has been driven from Europe, uh, and there are interests from growers of rice in Italy and Spain. We don't grow rice in this country. So there are lots of agricultural markets where you can start to write a trade policy for the UK. And we just haven't done that in this right. country for decades. So we have not been used to talking about the balance of producer and consumer needs. And the fact that some consumers are mostly price-driven, others are values-driven. Right. So you've started to hear a lot about chlorinated chicken and hormone-treated um, beef. You've probably already got bored with it. But most of the country hasn't listened to that. Uh, right. So there's a whole series of discussions. And for me, yeah, in the long term, I think there absolutely is opportunity. Why not write trade regimes right. that, that help British industries, like the British sugar industry? So this is the equivalent of the Millennium Bug. You're worried about yeah. the Millennium Bug, well, and you're saying to yourself, well, is this a chance while we think about how to patch up our system I, for the Millennium Bug, we need to think about our I've been, architecture and our configuration and hard, maybe we can do better? It's hard not to think of the Millennium Bug when you see a whole room full of advisors advising us about catastrophe coming and how we all need to invest <laughs> a huge amount of money in understanding the catastrophe. Um, I've heard that before, and I'm sure there is a huge amount of complexity for us to deal with. But once we get through that, I think you'll see in the long term, we're very optimistic about the future for Britain and the British sugar industry post-Brexit. And the, we should say the sugar industry was yeah. unusual in being hating the European Union and everything it had done to it, or more or less. Um, it's, it's more complex than that. So, right. you know, there's... Uh, <laughs> and again, we keep going back to this. So there's a that British... sounds like a bit you're not open to competition. <laughs> No, I, Do I misinterpret that? I think that, you that, misinterpreted Please clarify. That. So, so I said... <laughs> there were a bunch of rules that didn't suit the sugar industry about, about, about essentially, right? I mean... It, there's two, so the, the British sugar, if you want to get into the, again, you have to get closer to the detail. So there's the, what I would call the homegrown sugar industry, which has got yeah. beat. That's the most, one of the most competitive sugar industries in the world. We've, ex we've happily competed against uh, mainland Europe and we've competed against international sugar too. Um, but then there's also um, Tate and Tate Lyle, Lyle <laughs> who are in the room, um, who import sugar from around the world and they haven't been so happy with the regime. So how you sort that out yeah. is something government's going to have to have a view on and it will put together a policy. Um, I think that keeping sugar flowing, so we mm. export sugar, we're a deficit market for sugar. So if you don't yep. get things working, we'll run out of sugar, which you might not mind about, but we're about two million tonnes of sugar demand in this country. I can only produce 1.2. So where does the other 800,000 come from if, if you don't get that right? So it, it is important to look at all of the detail. Good, OK. I, I'm going to ask these three to come up with what their view... I'm going to say opportunities, and then you just word association to say what you like, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, Christoph. I think that uh, the point Paul is making is correct, that there is an opportunity for uh, Brit 
the British economy to step back and say, all right, we've had this trade policy because it's based upon compromises within the European Union. What do, you know, what margin does this give us? Because we can, you know, throw this under the bus. We don't care about it. Maybe we cared about it as the EU. So there is an opportunity to, to rethink some things. I guess there's the opportunity that arises through creative destru destruction. You know, you put the system under extreme stress, so it has to come up with <laughs> creative responses. Um, and you know, I think that uh, there. What uh, doesn't kill us makes us better. <laughs> the, the fundamental uh, situation of, of Britain being right next to continental Europe. You know, when someone in Canada says I'm flying to Britain, they might just as easily say I'm flying to Europe. That doesn't change. And so I think that th there's going to be still opportunities going forward for a very deep and. Uh, uh, profitable and, and mutually beneficial relations with Europe. And I think that that's the attitude that Britain and, and Europe are going into this about. Stefan, any uh, opportunities? On the British side, not the German side. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will make a different political point, despite the fact that I do not believe that the situation is, will become better between EU and, and UK. Um, if we go through this process of, an, of a trade agreement, and see the ups and downs, that may be a case for, uh, for, for free trade uh, develop out of it. Because uh, if, if, you should, if you debate free trade and globalization at the moment, not only on the national but on the global level, everything seems to be, uh, wh who cares uh, about free trade, nationalism comes back, uh, the, uh, um, um, and, and the virtues of free trade are not, not so positively good. If we go through that, the upside for me would be we will have seen the upside and down and, 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 and waving the ups and against the downs that we will have good arguments uh, uh, trans-European-wide that free trade is a, is, a, is, a, is a battleground to fight for. That's an, inter that's an interesting one. Um, just out of interest, a, a show of hands here, you have the opportunity of new trade deals for the UK, and you have the threat of being outside the customs union with bureaucratic impediments to, to internal trade. How many people offered the choice would say, I would, I would happily give up the, 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 the other trade deals in order to stay in the customs union? How many of you would say, yes, I'd stay in the customs union and not have the other trade deals? How many of you would say, look, I'd like to have the other trade deals, even if it means leaving the customs union? How many of you would like both? <laughs> but you can't have both. You can't have both. You can't be in the customs union and sign a trade deal with somebody else. That doesn't, that doesn't work. We've been trading with somebody else for decades. <laughs> no, but not, not, we haven't been able to sign a new deal with our, our own... No, the, the, the rule is you're either in the customs union and your Ridic EU does your trade. Question. That the EU does your trade or you leave the customs union and you can sign your own trade deals, apart from the Turkish-Syrian trade deal, which is a bit strange <laughs> and an unusual one. Um, Paul, you get the last word in this and your, your opportunity. There are two great opportunities. The gift to our neighbours in Europe is that they get more intensely focused on the success of Europe and they have, as a result of all of this, even greater success and growth and we will benefit from that. From the UK point of view, if we were to really to prosecute a world-class industrial strategy, there is a significant upside for the UK in all of this as well. So I do believe that we can all get, Europe and the UK, get ultimately, if we focus more on business growth and investment as a means to jobs and prosperity, we can all be better off out of this. And we can look back at as long as we're all still speaking, which is why Brexit exchange is important, then uh, there's upside, and that's what we should be fighting for. Paul, it, it, there's been a sort of strange contradiction, and I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, this is arguably in the Conservative Party, between two lines, and I just want to know whether you have noticed this contradiction or whether it bothers you or which way you would like it to be resolved. One is, if this turns sour, we have a backstop option of making sure that we are globally competitive, the Singapore option, lower tax, and we will exercise that if, if we need to. The other is, this is the time we need to listen to the public, left behind regions, and we need to you know, reinvent capitalism in a way that doesn't give the, 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 the rich all the, the, the bigger share of the pie. We need, to, we, we need to think about, if you like, the Burnleys and the Stokes that voted for Brexit and, and did so because they didn't like the way the world was working. 
and you'll listen to Theresa May saying workers on boards, which does not sound like the Singapore option for, for Brexit. Is there, is there a contradiction there? Well, I mean, look, this is an incredibly complicated issue. If you look at this going forward, the bottom line is we have the worst distribution of wealth across the UK of any developed country. So, uh, absolutely, the Prime Minister, to my mind, is right in saying we need to redistribute wealth. The only way to do that is to redistribute growth and investment. That's why the industrial strategy is a key place to do that. But, of course, there are lots of different points of view. I would just say to anyone, just look at the evidence. Just look at the facts. 90% of exports to Europe would have some sort of tariff consequence if we came out. Well, what does that mean for your business, your city, your town, your area? Look at the facts. And every time I look at the facts, I say, I think great pragmatism needs to trump politics. We can all with our lives, run our businesses and be happy. Panel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>